just in terms of the context for this, the Ohio Watershed Professionals Association uh, hopes to be uh, of significant assistance in coordinating and facilitating volunteer monitoring across the state of Ohio. And so it's wonderful today to have Max Herzog talking about the work that Cle Cleveland Water uh, Alliance has been doing up in the Lake Erie Basin. They've done a tremendous amount and uh, we hope to be able to build upon the work that they've done uh, in coordinating um, other efforts throughout the state. And uh, at some point, we're going to have a web page up on the OPA website, uh, OPA web, web page within the WAMO website, and I'd invite you to check that out uh, in the future to uh, see what's going on. And also welcome you to contact me if you have an interest in volunteer monitoring of uh, our rivers and streams in particular. Um, I'd like to give you a few notes about things coming up. Um, March 22nd, uh, there's a uh, spring event sponsored by WAMO and the Environmental uh, Professionals Network. Um, the title of the event is uh, based on a documentary called End Water for All. It has to do with water access and water affordability. Uh, the event uh, will start at the, it's gonna be at the 4-H building at Ohio State, starts at 7.15 a.m. There will be a virtual component that lasts until 10 a.m., uh, basically the breakfast speaker that day. Uh, this meeting involves a, a breakfast if you're able to attend in person. Um, and if you have to attend in person, the CEUs are available. It will last until 1145 that morning. Um, also on March 25th is the River Symposium. It's uh, sponsored by Ohio DNR and uh, you can register through the WAMO website. Uh, great event this year. Uh, it's gonna be happening here in Columbus. And finally, I'd like to mention that uh, WAMO has scholarships available to uh, high school and college students. Um, and the deadline for applications is April 15th. So if you are a uh, college student yourself or a high school student yourself or know some uh, folks who might be interested and eligible, uh, please check into that. It's my delight today to uh, welcome Max Herzog. Um, I was trying to figure out exactly when Max and I met. We actually have never met, but I did first see him uh, on a webinar and was excited about what he was doing. And it has since engaged him multiple times in meetings and uh, really appreciate the work that he's done and, and uh, um, really appreciated the, the things that we have um, been able to do together uh, so far already, but been probably about a year and a half, two years we figured this morning. And Max, is a, I'm just gonna read his bio briefly. Hopefully you saw it on the website. Uh, Max Her Herzog is an impact professional dedicated to engaging diverse stakeholders in the development of tools and strategies that drive community innovation and resilience at the regional level. He's currently working at the nexus of intelligent water systems, technology-led economic development, and Great Lake Basin Management as program manager with Cleveland Water Alliance. Max holds a BA from Oberlin College in political science and environmental studies. Um, really appreciate you doing this, Max. He's doing it on relatively short notice and surely appreciate uh, your stepping in. So um, just one note, if, you, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to unmute and, uh, um, and ask your question. So. And with that, I turn it over to you, Max. Thanks again. For sure. Thanks so much, Kurt. Really appreciate um, you inviting me here and, and, and Wemo hosting me uh, for this session. And, you know, I wouldn't say we don't, we've never met. You know, I think at this point, we've all realized that we can get to know each other pretty well over Zoom, although very excited to find times that we can start to see each other in person um, uh, as well coming up here. So, I'm going to go ahead and dive into sharing my screen, um, but as that's going, I'll go ahead and introduce myself a little bit more. Um, as Kurt said, I'm program manager with Cleveland Water Alliance. We are a not-for-profit economic development group based in Northeast Ohio, but working across the Lake Erie Basin. Um, we often talk about that as sort of the Detroit to Buffalo kind of uh, range. And our focus is really on innovative technologies and water resources. So looking at how um, advancements in the private sector, in the research world can help Lake Erie communities address some of their water resource challenges and how can we facilitate the development of more of those innovations across our region where there really is a, a depth in expertise and um, in current resources and trying to make sure that the solutions we develop here are things that can be leveraged across the world. Um, so really excited here today to dive into our work on citizen science um, with the Lake Erie Volunteer Science Network. Um, this is a newly established brand for a program that's been going on for about two and a half years now. 
um, and just excited to dive in and talk to you all about this. Hopefully shouldn't be talking for too long because I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time for question and answer and a little more of an interactive conversation here. Um, just to start though, and kind of ground in the broader context of Cleveland Water Alliance and our interests, we really approach this work from the perspective of trying to create a quote unquote smart lake. And for us, this really means driving the base level collection of data across our Great Lake and the watersheds that, that, that contribute to it, um, helping to transform that data into useful information um, that then translates into action. So there's kind of different levels of this engagement and it's really, our work is about engaging stakeholders at each level to ensure that we're getting the data collection coverage that we need, that we're communicating that data in a way that's helpful um, and that the community members and decision makers that need to take action based on that data are you know, considering it um, when they're making their decisions. And the, the sort of impetus for this project is thinking about, you know, what are the resources that we have currently across the Lake Erie Basin that we can be better leveraging to create a smarter lake, um, as it were. And so, you know, this really comes from the idea that at a fundamental level, people care about the Great Lakes. Residents across, um, you know, this whole macro region that we have uh, have a, a number of ways that they're connected to the lakes, whether it's that they grew up fishing or boating or just seeing it as they, they drive or walk by. Um, folks feel a really strong connection to these water resources in a way that is pretty unique um, to, uh, to our region. And this is something that local organizations across the Great Lakes region, but for us particularly um, across the Lake Erie region, are harnessing to really do important work, um, monitoring and managing these resources. So this is a map of just a few of the groups that are currently engaged in uh, citizen science or volunteer science activities across the region, organizing community members at the local level to collect water quality data, macroinvertebrates data, um, invasive species data in some cases, and using that data for local management, or in some cases, passing that up the chain to decision makers at the more regional level. So this is a really, you know, established area of work in our region um, that goes back. In some cases, these organizations have been doing this work for 10 or 20 years. Um, and some of these volunteers have been volunteering for that same amount of time. You know, there's a really deep engagement that we see um, in our communities with this kind of work. That being said, you know, these programs really emerge uh, in response to local water resource challenges and they're structured to kind of meet those needs, which is extremely important. But there are limitations to that kind of local focus that naturally emerges um, with these types of activities. On the one hand, a lack of standard protocols and methods between these different groups can result in fragmented and incomparable data sets. So if one community is collecting data with a particular focus, they are coming up with their own standards. You know, the data that they collect, even if they're looking at similar parameters, <clears throat> excuse me, may not be something that can be looked at uh, in comparison to or conjunction with their neighboring communities. Um, and even in cases where there are standardizations in place, they often exist on the county or state level. So when looking at a region like uh, Lake Erie that encompasses four states and uh, a Canadian province, there is even the folks that are looking towards higher standards have a degree of fragmentation between their sets. This also means that the lack of organizational reach, uh, or it means that there's a lack of organizational reach. When organizations are focused on collecting and using data locally, they're not necessarily thinking about how can we communicate this up the chain to decision makers at the state or regional level, to researchers. Um, and when they are thinking about that, which is often a focus for these groups, it, it tends to be based on their existing relationships or the institutions that are in their immediate vicinity, rather than trying to figure out some way that they can be as a local organization reaching out to 
all relevant stakeholders that might benefit from these data. It's really something that's beyond the capacity of a local soil water conservation district or parks district, um, a friends of group, you know, the types of groups that we see organizing these activities. And finally, the, the focus on local needs can restrict the, the value of the data for decision makers. Again, some of these groups are really interested in many of these groups are really interested in seeing their data find higher use beyond their own uh, capacity to use the data. But there's not always guidance or a clear path to impact for folks who want their data to do that. Um, and so it can restrict the value and accessibility of the data for decision makers. And so this is really in, what is what inspired us to kind of consider what it would mean to create a community of practice for these groups at the regional level. And that's what we are calling now the Lake Erie Volunteer Science Network. Um, and the goal of this group is to really unite and empower community members and the organizations that are, are, are giving their, their activity structure to collect, share, and engage uh, water quality data for the conservation and enrichment of our Great Lake and all who call it home. Really trying to make sure that this amazing work that's been happening at the local level in so many of our communities um, really has the greatest impact that it can and that these different groups are working together to increase uh, their collective impact in a strategic way. And so for us, this has been a multi-stage process as you might imagine, um, building this collaboration at the regional level. Um, and it's had a couple of key components, um, both from sort of the organizational collaboration side and then from the technical and programming side. And the question that we're trying to answer really here is how do we build a regional movement without losing this local impact? Again, there's a reason that these groups started focused on their individual watersheds. That is what resonates with, uh, with residents, with community members. That is what people care about, the water quality, you know, in their backyard or in their stretch of the lake on their beach. Um, this is really what gets folks engaged and, and what, what gets local stakeholders engaged in using the data. Um, so how can we translate that energy up to the regional level without losing that local focus as well? And the way that we've approached this has really been focused on partnering with existing practitioners in this area, which we call our local hubs. So looking at the most robust and established uh, volunteer monitoring programs in each of seven communities across the region um, is how we started this. And you can see them mapped out here. Um, we're pinning them to their, their closest local city, um, but actually our groups are based, you know, uh, in some cases further up in, in Ann Arbor, um, across Sandusky County, across Northern Chautauqua County, there is coverage here of a lot of different states and municipalities by these groups. And this is not fully comprehensive by any means of the groups that are engaged in this work um, across the Lake Erie Basin. This is just where we started in terms of building those partnerships. So we really took the approach of you know, contacting these folks figuring out, understanding more about their work and really trying to drill down to what are their needs and what would they hope to see from a regional collaboration of groups like themselves. And this engagement was really generously supported by a network of uh, community foundations and other funders through the Great Lakes One Water Initiative um, that really enabled us to focus on these initial seven communities and bring some dollars to the table to offer these folks to pay them to get involved in scoping out how they could collaborate together um, and pilot different programs. Um, and this is really important, as has been really important for us, knowing the very limited capacity of these groups. In a lot of cases, this is one facet of many different things that one paid staff member does um, to organize these volunteers. And a lot of structure and, and work has to go into training uh, volunteers, planning your local sampling plan, and then facilitating the actual collection of data. Um, and so bringing some additional capacity from a financial perspective um, has been really important to being able to get folks substantively engaged. And we really, the way we started with this engagement is through innovative pilot programs. So looking at 
individual technologies or community engagement tools that were of interest to um, our different stakeholders. And we heard from them, you know, we're interested in collecting these certain parameters, nutrients, uh, harmful algal bloom toxins, um, E. coli. And so we were able as Cleveland Water Alliance to go out and look across, you know, the, the network of, of technology innovators that we work with and try and identify, you know, are there solutions that are in the development stage that these groups could be testing out for application in this much more community centric, uh, local kind of uh, use case. And um, so we, we've tested out two devices through this program over the last couple of years. The first you can see in the top left, which is the Erie Open Systems um, nutrient spectrophotometer. This is a, a, a makerspace kind of fabricated 3D printed laser cut um, device that can analyze for nitrates and phosphates. We were able to show that um, it has tremendous value from an educational perspective, but there were some significant um, improvements that needed to be made from a technical perspective to really get it to the level that um, some of these groups want to see in terms of operational monitoring and provide some really concrete feedback to um, the innovators that are developing this device. Um, and at the same time, you know, this is a really exciting project to get these volunteer monitoring programs engaged in. They feel like they're at the cutting edge of technology. They're helping these professional researchers um, or startup companies to develop solutions that could have real impact in their area um, eventually. Um, we've also been working with these groups to develop new ways of engaging with uh, their community members. And a big area for engagement that we've heard is, um, you know, wanting more tools to uh, get high school students involved in, in citizen science activities. And so we work with these groups, as well as teachers in their area to develop a set of three curriculum modules um, that you can see kind of the, the topics of focused in the upper right hand corner there, you know, we took a number of different large topics of interest and then tried to put this lens of citizen science um, or volunteer science onto uh, this work. And so really it was through engagement in these innovative pilot programs that we started to build trust, build cadence, and really get the engagement of these partners and trying to think through at a higher level, you know, what is needed to really empower us to work at the regional level for collective impact. And there were two kind of key technical components that really we came to as a, as a collaborative that um, were needed to support this. The first was a shared data platform. Um, the idea of trying to connect the, the many different data sets that folks are collecting um, at the local level and be able to visualize them together at the regional level. Um, and so through this program, we were able to get all of our participating partners on a system called Water Reporter. Uh, this is a data platform developed by a nonprofit data shop um, out of the Chesapeake Bay region called The Commons. And we've been really happy with their approach to handling data collected by these volunteer science programs. Um, it's very focused on the user interface, making it easy for folks to upload data. Um, and then also having these kind of built in QAQC checks for organizers or um, admins, whoever the groups kind of determined to designate as that check to make sure that data contributed isn't you know, wildly out of expectations and, um, you know, being able to throw together some simple visualizations to help map uh, the data being collected. And we were actually able to work with the, the team at Water Reporter to build this custom map that shows all of the different groups contributing um, through our program on one map, differentiating like here's the data sets used by different groups, but being able to show them together and actually being able to start to compare the data collected. Um, and it's really through this exercise that, you know, the next piece that we needed to work on together emerged. And that was the need for shared data standards. So it's really amazing to be able to visualize um, all these data together and be able to see, you know, what it is that different communities are collecting. But not all the communities are collecting the same parameters. Um, collecting at the same frequency. And even when they are, 
uh, collecting some of these same baseline parameters, they may be using different underlying methods that aren't necessarily established as comparable. And so what we came to is that in order to really advance the credibility of the data collected as a network, we needed to do some work to standardize these basic collection and management efforts. Um, and so we were really fortunate to be able to partner with the Water Data Collaborative, which is a national network of citizen science organizations and research practitioners very focused on this kind of challenge of elevating the credibility of, of, of volunteer collected data and um, encouraging groups to start to be collaborating at more of the regional and eventually national level. Um, and they are really helpful in, in helping us think through kind of identifying a shared monitoring purpose, this kind of purpose of condition and trend assessment baseline, getting this finger of a pulse on what's going on in our watersheds across the region um, and helping us focus on collection methods, um, as well as the study design and data management components. And a really big part of that data management piece was really just getting folks all using the same platform and the same input fields um, to be collecting these baseline parameters. And of course, a really key part of this has been engaging stakeholders in the process, having these standards be things that are developed by the volunteer science groups, um, but also developed in collaboration with folks at the state agency level and in the research community to ensure that you know these eventual data users um, are feeling that these standards are robust enough that they know that the data can be can be determined to be of known quality, which is really what we feel is most important here. Um, getting citizen science or volunteer science groups up to a research or state agency standard of collecting data is often infeasible. It goes beyond the capacity of groups um, to train or to uh, have access to lab space in a lot of cases. Um, so really just being able to nail down, here is the known quality of the data and what we know we can use it for. Again, our goal is really to get to this, this condition trend assessment or analysis use case um, has been really key. And our approach so far has been to start from the low hanging fruit and our goal is to build over iterations. So we're in the process now of finalizing our first drafts of standards. And we really picked um, you know, the, the, the parameters that were most common across the groups and where you know, market available technologies are considered very reliable. So these are parameters like dissolved oxygen, uh, temperature, uh, pH, and conductivity. Um, and we know that these aren't necessarily the parameters that are gonna give us the best picture initially of watershed health across the whole region, but being able to implement them in a standardized way across all of these groups is sort of a, a test to see, can we really do this and be collecting comparable data at the regional level? Um, and we're, we're, our goal is to build over iterations, as I said, to inc include some of the more ambitious parameters um, and be able to build up to that point of really generating uh, high value data for folks in the research and, dis and policy worlds, um, in addition to obviously that local use case of, of watershed management. Max? Yeah. I don't know if you want to address this now or later, but a question has been asked that, you know, why don't you all just like adopt level two standards uh, for the state of Ohio? Um, why all this work and, and why not just adopt, adopt those? It's a really good question. Part of the challenge is what I pointed to earlier, which is that we're talking about organizing at the Great Lake level and not all of our partners are based in Ohio. So Michigan and New York and Pennsylvania and Ontario all have different approaches to how is this data standardized? Are these data standardized? Um, and so our goal is to, you know, rather than working within uh, the current systems to bring the stakeholders involved in creating those systems to the table to ask them again, you know, what are your needs? So we have Ohio EPA, direct, the Division of Surface Water directly engaged in the development of these standards. Um, and our goal is to use this as sort of a baseline to have this be uh, the standards that we're developing be um, flexible enough 
that more groups are able to meet and contribute, but then also be working with those groups to identify the pathways to uh, higher data use for those that have that capacity. Um, and so, you know, our hope in, in diving into the collaboration with WAMO and, and the work that we've been talking about, Kurt, is really to be able to establish a use case for taking these regional standards that are looking at a Great Lake Basin and seeing how they can be helpful um, at a state level um, and, and, and how they can be built upon to dovetail more closely with uh, programs like oh, uh, Ohio EPA's Credible Data Program. So those are a couple of thoughts on that. I'm happy to speak about it more. Um, so the question that we get to here is how do we fully unlock the potential of, uh, of these data and their impact? Um, and, and how do we work, you know, not just to be collecting the data part of the smart lake, but transforming it into information and looking towards action. And this is really talking more about our activities moving forward. Um, we have a couple of things on the horizon here. You know, with the establishment of these standards, we're hoping to engage new communities with a common approach to implementation and impact. Um, we're actually going to be hosting a two-day workshop in Cleveland on uh, mid-March, kind of in, in tandem with the State of Lake Erie, IAGLA State of Lake Erie Conference, um, to walk people through the standards that we've created so far and also really talk about uh, priorities for next steps. You know, what are the other parameters or areas of collaboration? that folks really wanna see us be um, prioritizing as we move forward. And, um, oh, that was an interesting patterning there. <laughs> um, our goal is to be implementing these standards and then beginning to evaluate them and iterate them, iterate on them over the next two years. Um, and we're really fortunate to have some funds available through the state of Ohio to actually purchase equipment for these different groups. Um, because we know again that, uh, money is, is a challenge with a lot of these groups. There's not a tremendous amount of funding available for these type of activities. And so we're really fortunate to be able to um, bring some of those resources to the table. And then, you know, as part of this overarching community of practice, one of the really exciting things that we're able to do is have more focused conversations on how we can, as a network, continue to build greater impact. So we've, we've been convening a working group on standards um, that's engaged Ohio EPA and Ohio Sea Grant. Um, and we're going to continue that work as we iterate on these standards. But we're also looking at opening up uh, conversations focused on the sustainability of this network. How does this ultimately transition from, um, you know, funding from community foundation partners who have really generously um, gotten us off the ground and given us a couple years of runway uh, to really build out this program? Um, but how does this become something that lives, you know, within existing budgets of participating organizations or the data end users? Um, this is something that we really want to be focusing in on over the next couple of years. Then the other piece that we're trying to bring in is a, a more robust conversation around equity. Um, citizen science or volunteer science is, is really something that people in the, the water management space often think of as a very grassroots kind of mode of engagement. Um, but the reality is that this is work that is almost always organized by institutions at some level, whether it's a research institution um, or a local watershed group. And that participation in volunteer activities have fundamental barriers, um, you know, that, that preclude true diverse participation and that we really see these groups kind of representing in a lot of cases um, our communities in their most suburban white and gray iterations. So thinking about how can this work, you know, become more relevant to our low income communities and in our, our communities of color. And, you know, we know there's, again, barriers to participation just in terms of talking about volunteership at all. So if not more relevant in terms of that, then what can we do to center issues of environmental justice um, in this kind of work and be more relevant in that way? And these are questions that are really being or asked at the national level right now in conversations about citizen science. Um, if you, you all are familiar with this work and have been following kind of the discourse around this, you may have seen that there's a lot of activity around rebranding to community science because of the charged nature of citizenship in this area. We as a network have elected to use volunteer science um, because there's a sort of tradition of more grassroots uh, research 
that that community science often describes. So there's a lot of really kind of complex conversation to have around how this work can really be fully benefiting all of our community members. Um, and we're really excited to be able to convene this community of practice to participate in those conversations. Um, and then of course, you know, our eventual goal is to be able to substantively engage researchers and decision makers with data of known quality. And that starts with this year implementing these baseline standards and starting to collect data with comparable methods across all the regions. Um, it starts with synergizing our standards as closely as we can with existing state standards. We are pulling together kind of a table that shows the different approaches across each state and each and our one province um, in terms of uh, that state or provincial level approach and how our data can be plugging into those systems. Um, but we really wanna make sure that we're keeping folks in the research and decision maker community engaged throughout the process so that their voices can be heard and that they're helping to steer the direction of this um, as well as these volunteer, volunteer groups on the ground. So that's sort of a high level overview of this program that we've put together over the last couple of years and the work that we're engaged in right now. Um, super happy to engage with anyone here who has questions or thoughts or wants to talk about how this work might expand into your area or um, uh, you know, translate into impact for you specifically. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been talking to Wamo and Kurt about how some of the work that we've done might be picked up by Ohio centric organizations to be brought, you know, into central and southern Ohio. Um, we're having similar conversations with our partners in Michigan and in New York and in Ontario. Um, so just really eager to have a conversation with folks here. And, um, but I guess with that, I'll, I'll thank you. For, thank you so for, much for taking the time. Yeah. So with that, if anyone wants to, you know, you can raise your hand, you can unmute, you can drop your questions in the chat. I think um, all of those are uh, viable options in terms of bringing your question to the table. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to compliment you on doing what really has not been done before, which is to bring together groups from around the lake um, together into some kind of unified uh, package. But it, it, it also, I like the way that you're looking at the lake is what happens in this puddle of water that we call Lake Erie really starts in the watersheds. And so you're doing watershed monitoring and things of that sort. But I wonder, um, do you have any plans for coupling that with events in the lake? Uh, monitoring somehow in the lake, either with uh, uh, constant recording and recording buoys or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely, Bob. I uh, really appreciate you bringing that uh, to the table. Um, you know, one of the reasons that this work has been very watershed focused to this point is because that's where these volunteer programs exist. Um, in a lot of cases, they don't have access to vessels or as much interest in open water monitoring. Uh, because again, these these volunteers are really concerned about what's going on in their creeks and their rivers in their backyard. We do see some examples of volunteer programs uh, monitoring in the open water, and um, you know the strongest example in our region is that facilitated by Ohio Sea Grant in engaging with um, uh, uh, boaters and then sampling water on the open lake. But our projects, uh, in terms of more generally trying to increase the collection of data across the region, definitely encompass and focus on collection on the lake. Um, our work with deployed buoys and under kind of this umbrella of the Smart Lake initiative has been very focused on getting actionable information to drinking water utilities. Um, and we're really excited also about the potential for higher frequency deployed sensors to be playing a big role in watershed monitoring and particularly in performance monitoring for um, wetlands, uh, especially with the, the large investments going into that area of work here in Ohio. So certainly, you know, collaboration with existing professional researchers um, that do have access to vessels and are able to regularly sample on the water is key. 
providing volunteers the opportunity to engage in that kind of work when there is the capacity, also important, but finding ways that that data can be, or those data can be consistently collected by deployed sensors in strategic locations um, is, is, is very important as well. And one of our approaches with the Water Reporter platform has been to ensure that we have an open API, um, which is essentially an open connection point for any data analysis or data processing platform so that anyone who wants to pull these citizen science data or volunteer science data um, into their calculations or models um, are able to leverage it. Our goal with this particular project is really to unlock the potential of these data contributors, um, but our overall strategy is certainly oriented towards how can data from many different sources be brought together and, and used to inform action. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Just a quick response to a comment in the in the chat regarding um, pulling together data that's already been uh, developed in Southwest Ohio. That's part of what the larger network is working on. Our, our next step, as far as the state of Ohio at least, is developing a um, common platform for uploading our data. Uh, Max uh, Max's group has chosen Water Reporter, and that's that's who they're working with to upload data. Um, what we're working on in, in this larger informal network is um, what what could we use as a state of Ohio? What could we recommend? Our sense is we may not come up with one single platform. We might offer some options to people, but uh, we're trying to do the kind of thing uh, that Max is talking about uh, for the rest of the folks in Ohio. And we'll be um, hosting some sort of event to give people a chance to hear from different platform providers and try to choose something um, that would work for, for different groups in other parts of Ohio. Uh, so that's in process. And uh, um, folks are welcome to, to listen in our conversations. We don't have a closed task force. It's sort of an informal group. And you're welcome to contact me and, and uh, or Max for that matter and, and uh, connect you with that larger group. Um, we also had a question in the comments um, about, Could this method be used and accepted by Ohio EPA to monitor rivers and streams? They are not going to monitor so thoroughly or often any, often anymore. Um, do you have any thoughts about that, Max? That's certainly our goal, uh, you know, to eventually get to that point and be collecting the data in a standard way that is relevant to assessing those components. Um, you know, it's obviously going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and part of our goal here is to really make sure that we're uniting these groups so we can present a united front of here is what we have and we want to know what we need to do, but also grounding it in the capacity of these groups to actually be able to deliver. Um, so that's very much the goal. And, you know, we're, we feel this program is, is working to address a very concrete gap in the level of granularity of data that states and provincial entities are able to currently gather. Um, and so again, you know, we're trying to ground this in data of known quality, not data of ubiquitously uh, impeccable quality. Um, and, you know, hoping that that becomes something that, you know, folks are seeing enough value in to be leveraging it, not just in, in research, but also um, for that, that routine monitoring of, of waterways from a regulatory perspective. I have to admit, Max, you cut out for me. I don't know if that was a universal issue um, or if others were able to hear everything you said. I feel like I got the basic message you were giving, but. Okay, but it, uh, well, the basic message is that's something we want to work towards. You know, we don't have, you know, established at this point. This is still very early stages work. We're about to put out our first iteration of standards for these very baseline parameters. Um, but our goal is to continue to work with state agencies to understand what is needed to meet their thresholds and also push them to see, you know, here's the capacity of what these groups can really deliver. And if you're able to meet them where they're at, then you can get data that's standardized across this entire region um, and use it for, for your purposes as well. And so it, we're trying to make it a, a conversation and one that's a little more organized. <laughs> I just wanted to note something else was brought up in the com in the comments. Um, there is a um, database, statewide bay database, developed I think uh, the Voidovich Center at Ohio University that's maintained there, um, and 
there's a link in the chat if people are interested in taking a look at it. That's one of the options that I, that I know our network will be looking at or our task force is looking at, uh, our ad hoc task force as one of the possibilities. Um, one of the things that will make people sure people know about is, is that's, that's an option for people to upload data. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great resource. I think pretty focused in, in the Southwest kind of region. And I know initially in response, I think to some acid mine drainage monitoring, um, really robust platform. Um, we ended up use, using a different one that we felt had a lot of uh, momentum and that we felt confident we'd be able to get you know consistent uh, tech, not tech support, but there's a whole lot of parameters that can be considered in sort of selection of your platform for your program. So I'm happy to talk to folks if you're interested to learn more about how we made our decision and, and recommendations there because, and really, you know, I guess would encourage you to get involved in these conversations that, that Kurt and others are convening across Ohio because we're very much in the process of kind of trying to identify what are those key parameters for us in terms of deciding, you know, here is the platform or the platforms that, um, you know, we wanna be encouraging folks to use across Ohio. What do you see as the next steps for people on this call, Max, from your point of view? The next steps for people on this call are, you know, I would say, please get involved with, uh, with the group that WAMO is, is helping to convene um, at the Ohio level, if you're based in Ohio, which I assume this audience is almost exclusively. Um, you know, we're going to be bringing these baseline standards that we've developed to this group and saying, you know, what seems useful here? talk through our approach, talk through our process and see what, what can be lifted directly and what can um, what process pieces can be adopted and what needs to happen to really be able to make this something that's relevant across the state. You know, we've really approached this from the perspective of how can we be doing condition and trend assessment in the watersheds of Lake Erie? That's a very specific use case for this work. Um, and lots of people are using it for a lot of different things. And so I think this approach of engaging with stakeholders, talking about needs and using those to really inform how we can have greater collective impact at the regional level is something that I'm hoping to bring um, to that group. And, and I feel we're, we're on a great track to, to be building that support. Um, and I, I don't know, Dana, what would be the best way for people to, to get in touch with with me or Max or whoever who have an interest in engaging more with uh, the efforts in Ohio? Uh, people can contact the Water Management Association of Ohio at admin at wmao.org and we can distribute that information. That'd be great, thank you. Um, another question here, Max. Have wastewater and, and water treatment facilities been engaging engaged for finding data they already have been collecting? Um, that's a great question. And I, you know, this gets to some of our broader efforts as Cleveland Water Alliance, which is really looking at how can data from multiple sources and multiple types of providers be integrated and um, processed into some useful information. We've engaged uh, some wastewater and water treatment plants in the process of developing our standards, just in terms of hearing from them, what are their data collection priorities? What do they see as the most pressing water quality issues that they deal with? Um, you know, providing that sort of feedback so it can inform our process. Um, but I, I believe, and we believe as Cleveland Water Alliance, that there is a need for being able to, again, bring together data from heterogeneous sources and be able to consider it um, alongside each other to inform decisions. And, and that sort of integration, um, I'm not sure exists anywhere in our region right now. Um, although I'm sure, you know, our state agencies are, are doing uh, a great job of bringing together those data to inform their decisions. It's not necessarily something that everyone has access to um, in terms of a common platform or a common data source. I, I missed the, an earlier question about uh, water reported data being encompassed in any, or st statewide efforts. I will say that we're not going to be creating any new platform that we're going to be looking at existing platforms to see what would work for volunteers for different sources. But Max, maybe you can say something about 
what you know about Water Porter in terms of its capacity to integrate with other databases or talk to other databases at, at any level? Yeah, absolutely. So that's really been um, a priority for us. And one of the main things that helped us feel confident we could dive in with Water Reporter, knowing that they're going to continue to iterate on their platform, um, but particularly that they were focused on building that open openness to connect with other sources. Um, and I would encourage anyone really looking at a, a citizen or volunteer science platform to make sure they have a documented um, API so that researchers, state agencies, anyone who wants can create an ongoing real-time plugin with the data so that as it's added, it, it gets added to multiple locations. And we're thinking about this as a really big value add for our partners in terms of, you know, being able to create integrations with EPA's water quality exchange, uh, create integrations with, um, with the Great Lakes Observing System, with the Great Lakes Data Stream, you know, these different platforms that are focused on integrating multiple data sources together um, and also it's important for us to think about, um, you know, as we're looking to bring together a variety of Lake Erie data sets, we want to make sure that the sets we're working to build and consolidate are open and accessible. Um, so I think that's very, very important. And that API, I believe, for, for Water Reporter should be fully documented now. Um, if it's not, you know, shareable yet, it should be within the next few weeks. Um, and so if you have a model or platform that you're trying to pull Lake Erie volunteer science data into, um, we should be able to help you make that connection in, in really in, in short order, um, if that's of interest. And, and my hope would be that that becomes, you know, something ubiquitous across Ohio, that, that accessibility. I'm gonna read this whole comment, uh, Max. For equity, we need robust parameters like conductivity, pH, turbidity, for example, it can be done cheaply with good result what state money might be available to create subsidiary programs at the local level colleges uh, and maybe high schools? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I'm the person to ask about exactly how that should work. I know that we have been able to um, access some funding for water technology innovation at the state level and at the federal level, some of which we're able to bring to bear this year um, to help groups that we're working with purchase equipment. Um, but I would, I would say I definitely agree that identification of funding sources and being able to lock in the money needed to provide equipment is a primary barrier to getting folks engaged at full scale and a really big barrier to asking folks to engage in a standardized way, right? These are communities that are, are groups that have limited capacity. And again, they're not going to be able to just, if, if you just say, hey, here's the standard across the state or the standard across the region, meet it or else you don't count. Um, it's very challenging for a lot of groups to do that. And so being able to support them in getting the equipment they need to fill gaps where they're not able to collect data of, of sufficient quality currently is really essential to making this um, accessible. Um, as part of that comment, uh, you know the different parameters that might be collected were mentioned. Max, could you talk about which parameters you expect uh, the working group to have developed standards for in the relatively near future? Yeah, so we will have standards for pH, temperature, uh, water temperature, excuse me, um, conductivity, and dissolved oxygen by the end of this month um, or, or early next. Um, and our goal at our, our summit that we're putting together in on March 14th and 15th is to really identify what are what's the next tier of priorities. We started with the lowest hanging fruit, the, the parameters that were collected by almost all of the groups that we were working with, um, and also where the technology is really readily available off the shelf and pretty reliable. Um, but our hope is to see some more ambitious uh, goals emerge from this next event, um, you know, we've heard nutrients come up a lot. Um, we've heard uh, E. coli come up a lot. We've heard interest in collecting macroinvertebrate data. Um, so there's a whole host of ways we could look at engaging with this. And um, our goal is just really to be building over iterations, you know, kind of crossing a couple more parameters off the list, but then at the same time, considering what sort of non-parameter things do we need to focus on? Things like 
how, what sort of programmatic recommendations can we give out as a regional network for how to have more equitable engagements? Or what recommendations can we give out in terms of how folks are communicating um, their findings within these different parameters and what can actually be known about your local waterway based on a dissolved oxygen reading or, or a conductivity reading? Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that we're hoping to continue to build out um, over iterations in the coming years. Wonderful. I'm just going to read this comment. I realize y'all can read the chat, but it doesn't hurt, I think, for everybody to hear this too. If anyone is interested, the Rocky River Watershed Council records data on Water Reporter 2. Uh, they and the Cleveland Metro Parks have volunteer data collection opportunities. So uh, good to know about those. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually, Cleveland Metro Parks is one of our key found, founding partners with this network. Um, and it's been through the funding that we've brought to the table that Rocky River Watershed Council is collecting these data. And it, we're really excited to have multiple groups in, in Northeast Ohio participating um, because that's that's our hometown. And we hope to see um, folks all in that area, you know, at, at our, our event in, in mid-March um, so that we can kind of work on next steps together. So thanks for observing that, Abby. I see also that Christine has had her hand up for, or had their hand up for a little bit. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear. Excellent. Okay, so full disclosure, in a past life, I was the executive director of an environmental nonprofit in New England. And I'm loving this conversation. I'm just so excited to hear about um, all that you guys are doing. Um, my day job is um, is at Ohio, P Ohio EPA. So <laughs> I work on the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance. So I wanted to just kind of uh, put out a couple of thoughts, if I may. Um, Absolutely. Regarding environmental and justice engagement, um, I worked in a watershed that was in two states, had an estuary, and um, there was a lot of environmental justice communities within my watershed. And as such, we found that the best way to um, engage those communities was to actually set up a booth at one of their events. Um, so if it was the Latin American festival, we put in a booth and we had materials specifically for how to engage them and why it was important because they're swimming in this river. Don't they want to know that there's combined sewer overflows happening in it? And so it was it was a really great tool. So we just locked on. There was a um, an Asian festival that happened right on the river. And we were there. So that was just one thought. Um, another thought with regard to purchasing equipment. We um, had a very small budget. We were about 250,000 budget per year, but we had over we had hundreds of volunteers. We had volunteers who brought their boats. We had volunteers who wanted to be on the boat because it was a cool place to be. And um, we had them all trained on how to use the equipment. And so this goes back to a standard. We were using EPA standards. So we would have region one come in and train our folks. We developed a QAP that was acceptable um, for, it was New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Uh, you guys decide to Google stalk me, you won't find me because I have a different last name now. <laughs> but you, you might be able to find out who I am <laughs> at some point. But we were using a QAP and that is how we were able to get everybody on board in multiple states to produce similar information because we had one cat quap that was developed with the aid of EPA region one that was accepted by um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Okay, and the last thing with regard to purchasing equipment, we got a lot of grants. We had to write the grants. So, you know, for the person who was asking about high schools and local groups, it's just a matter of simply putting in a request. And sometimes you can actually go to the maker of the equipment you're looking for and tell them what you're trying to do and get a grant from them. So we've gotten tens of thousands of equipment either from grants. Um, and my data is really old, by the way, this was like before 2010. So like when I say past life, I mean past life. <laughs> but I mean, I didn't wanna um, 
usurped this whole piece, but I just love hearing these discussions and wanted to give a little insight into, you know, one of the, some of the things that work for us. And, and if you want to, you can engage me off offline as well. Yeah, that would be great, Christine. Thanks so much for sharing thoughts on all those different topics and would love to connect and, and learn more. Um, there's a lot, a lot there that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, let's see, a couple of other comments. We discovered in a study of the nutrient budget in the Little Miami River that the water wastewater treatment um, plants has values of effluent, nu effluent nutrients in mixing zone and above the plant effluent. Is this generally reported OEPA and could be mined for public viewing? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that folks from Southwest Ohio are involved in our ad hoc group and they may know answers to that. There may be others on, the, on this call that know the answer. Do you know anything about that, Max? It's outside your region, so. Um, I'm not sure if I've heard of that or not. Um, yeah, I'd have to look into it a little more. And that's one of the things we're trying, that's part of the reasons that um, this effort is happening statewide is to try to make sure that the kind of data being collected is accessible to people. Um, do you know anything about the data available on the USGS site, Max, since that's also been mentioned as a source of data? For sure, yeah, that's generally, I think, considered one of the most reliable sources of data at the federal level in terms of flow, particularly, but yep, absolutely, that's a, that's a major data source to consider. And Michael uh, Miller talked about uh, volunteer training workshops that are um, um, available that they do. And by they, I assume that you mean some someone down in Southwest Ohio, Mike? Uh, uh, yes, I'm a, a, a level three chemist uh, and trainer for the state, in the state of Ohio. So uh, about once a year, uh, we give a course to, with COVID, only about seven or eight students uh, at a time, it's about all we can handle. Uh, and these are our volunteers for the uh, Butler County Stream Team, the Lower Great Miami River Water Quality Monitoring Group, the now expired Little Miami um, Saturday Stream Snapshot, and the Mill Creek Alliance. Okay, thank you. I will also say that OPA has, is available to do trainings related particularly to macroinvertebrates. I know that there are trainings uh, available related to habitat and macroinvertebrates available through Midwest Biodiversity Institute. And hopefully one of the things that will emerge from this is, is a more um, established and, and uh, available network of, of trainings uh, that people know about throughout the state of Ohio uh, as there is need. Um, and Christina has indicated that uh, data commit, submitted to the IVPA is public data. Um, can people just search that database, Christine, uh, to find out what's there? Yeah, I mean, you can click on the link. I will tell you that it's um, not the most easy way to collect data. It would be, I think, a, an effort in uh, some Excel expertise of downloading multiple years and then filtering out what you, you're actually looking for. But it's, it's there and it's a wealth of information. It's, like I said, it's not the easiest way of collecting data, but um, I can't speak for drinking water or surface water, but I, I don't think it would be um, completely against what they do if you wanted some data on the background, you know, for a certain number of years for a particular thing uh, for them to put, for you to put in a request if they can draw that in one report for you. Whether or not they'll do it, I don't know. But, you know, because we're all busy, we all have like a ton of work and we're, we're working, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, Mucho trabajo, poco dinero. Well, maybe not poco dinero, poco tiempo. Mucho trabajo, poco tiempo. Lots of work, little time. So it's possible if you had a very specific request, I want this water treatment plant, oxygen data for this 10 year period that they may be able to pull out that one request for you. Um, but I, I don't see them doing that multiple 
times. <laughs> but like I said, the data is there and I do believe it's possible to just download it all in a big dump into a, a spreadsheet and then filter it for what you want. And just uh, a website, how do we get to it? I put the link there. Okay, I didn't see it. Uh, like you know, I, I wouldn't mind piggybacking on what Christine said. Uh, my name's Maria Domingo and I work uh, for RCAP and we focus on water oh, and sewer you. infrastructure. Hey, Christine. Um, and so we do a lot of projects for small communities where there's obvious water and wastewater treatment issues. And I use eDocs quite a bit if I want to get a sense of here's a community, I'm wondering if their wastewater or sewer treatment plan is having some issues. And that's all public information. And, and it's a wealth of information for things related to that. And uh, Max, I know I'll be reaching out to you since you said that is an area of concern. Uh, because we do a lot of uh, work in, in primarily rural communities of Ohio, and uh, I think we could be a resource as well. Great. I look forward to it. Maria, can you say what eDocs is? Uh, yeah. It, um, if you, like, Google EPA, e, Ohio EPA eDocs, it'll come right up. Oh, Christine's pointing. She just put that in there put a link in, in the, the uh, chat. I put it in the chat. <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to the Ohio EPA staff. Uh, they've been very helpful to me when I've been looking for data, particularly related to biology. And, and uh, um, I, I also commend their website for state collected data that, that you can find it in a variety of places there. Um, there's a nice map, interactive map and things like that. I'm aware that we're past one o'clock and uh, I'm so been so grateful. There've been so many interested in this and uh, uh, Dana gave a contact through WAMO if you'd like to be involved more and uh, um, appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, Dana, do you have any final comments before we wrap up here? No, I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. And thank you again, Max. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is a great discussion. Thanks, thanks all for taking the time and I uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take Bye, care. Everyone.